Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Offlick. I'm the Community Relations Manager with the Seattle Office of Emergency Management. We're going to get started in just a few minutes here. We're just going to give it a couple minutes to let some more folks get on. Um, you'll see up on the screen some instructions for turning on captions and subtitles. So you can turn the captions on and then you can also change the language if you want captioning in a language other than English. So just give us a couple minutes here and we'll get started. Thank you. Hi everyone, we'll just get started in a couple minutes. Uh, again, on the screen um, are instructions to turn on captioning and how to change the language. Um, so if you click on that little CC button at your bottom right hand corner, you should be able to turn captions on. And then if you hit the settings button, which is that little gear icon, you should be able to change the language with a few different language options. Just about another minute or so and we'll get started. <clears throat> All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, again. My name is Matt Offlick. I'm the Community Relations Manager with the Office of Emergency Management. Thanks for joining us this evening. This is our fourth webinar in our series, and tonight we're going to be focusing on utility restoration. And so we have representatives from our Seattle Public Utilities and Seattle City Light. Um, I'm just going to cover a, a couple housekeeping things before I turn it over. Um, we have a few different speakers tonight. So as we have to kind of switch who's controlling slides and switch the camera feed, there might just be a couple seconds there where we're figuring things out. So bear with us, please. Um, I'll just mention again, I already mentioned it a couple of times, but you can turn on captions and switch the language. If you registered via our events calendar and included an email when you registered, or you signed into this Teams meeting using an email, then we should be capturing your email. And we will follow up early next week with an email that includes the slides we show tonight and a link to the recording. So we are recording the session tonight and we will post this to YouTube. And so we'll send those things early next week. If there's any questions that we can't answer tonight and we need to follow up on, we'll also share that way. Um, just a reminder, we have one more session left um, on September 14th focused on transportation restoration, so you can still register for that on our OEM events calendar at seattle.gov slash emergency. If you have questions throughout the presentation, feel free to put them in the Q&A. And Tay Thatch with our Office of Emergency Management will be looking at those. If it's something she can answer while we're going, then she'll shoot you a response. Um, but if it's something that's more appropriate for one of our subject matter experts today, we'll hold it until the end and just do all the questions at the end because there is uh, a delay from when we're talking in real time to when you see it. Um, 
Other than that, Tay also put in the Q&A section a link to a resource document. Um, so some of the things that get referenced in the presentation tonight are listed in that PDF that's on our website and has links to those resources so you can get to them. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Chad Beekler with our Seattle Public Utilities. Great, Matt. Uh, good uh, good evening, everybody. This is Chad Beekler. Just a quick test, Matt, just to make sure that you can see the slideshow and that you can see me while I'm talking here. We can't see you yet. I'm going to do that. One moment. Great. Thanks, Matt. All right, now we got Chad and the slides. Great, thanks, Matt. So everybody can see the slides up there. There's a little bit of a review here on, um, oh, it looks like I just lost the slides now. Matt, it'll be just a second. I'll see if, uh, did you lose them too, Matt? I still see them as being up. Okay, great. I think I figured it out on my end. Okay, we'll work through the technical difficulties here pretty quick and get on our way. There's a quick review of the captions and subtitles there. Uh, it looks like to turn them on, you just hit the closed caption button in your video controls, and you can change the language in there as well if you need to do that. It looks like it's really helpful. Um, so real quick, I'm really excited to be here. Again, my name is Chad Beekler. I'm the Emergency Manager for Seattle Public Utilities. Uh, it's good to be here with Matt and Brittany, who you'll hear from later, and, and her colleague, Michelle, from Seattle City Light. Uh, we talk to each other all the time, you know, every week, sometimes every day. So it's great to be here with all of you uh, together to talk to you about how we do utility restoration and some of the impacts to the utilities that we think uh, would be interesting to you, some of the things we think you need to know about, uh, and also some of the things you can do to help us if we have a really significant seismic event. Um, so right off the bat, some of the things I'll cover uh, are just uh, an overview of Seattle Public Utilities. We're actually three utilities kind of combined. So I'll talk about the different roles that each of those have. Um, we'll talk a little bit about damage assessment, especially in the context of a post seismic incident and how we do that and how we're getting information about our system. And as we look to restore uh, our utility services, how we prioritize those, right? Not just which things are most important to us, like buildings and pipes and things, but uh, what uh, really are our values as we move through our incident response here. And then we'll talk about your personal preparedness at home and at work and how that relates to SPU and how we can partner to make sure that uh, when we do have a significant earthquake, um, that we're as ready as we possibly can be. And things are going to be uh, pretty gnarly. Uh, there's going to be some significant impacts, but we can really help each other out by doing just a few simple things, especially related to utilities. Uh, and then I'll also talk about how we work with our city of Seattle and regional partners, because uh, Seattle Public Utilities Service Area and uh, how we work just isn't inside the Seattle city limits like we usually think about them. Uh, and I'll show you some maps later on that will help uh, help show how far some of the things we have and some of the people that work for our utility actually go to make sure that we have things like drinking water and solid waste and drainage and wastewater service. So we'll just dive right into it. Um, like Tay said, uh, and Matt said they're going to be able to answer some of your questions directly uh, into the chat there, but uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. So maybe if we're waiting till the very end, go ahead and, and jot them down because I really do want to make sure that we're able to, to get to those. I've tried to highlight a lot of the, the different things that I think you all would like to know about. But as we move through this here today, um, I'm sure that there might be something that uh, you're interested in that I didn't cover because Seattle Public Utilities is a big complex organization with a lot of responsibilities when it comes to earthquake response. Uh, so I want to make sure that we touch on everything that we can. Uh, and I'm just one person here today. So um, what I will say is I'll, I know a lot about how SDU responds. That's my job as our emergency manager. Uh, but there's a lot of really technical people that work for us too. Uh, and if we need to get in touch with those folks afterwards, I'm happy to work with Matt and to make sure we follow up. Okay, so uh, just the Seattle Public Utilities overview. I mentioned that we're three utilities in one, and often the first one people think about is our drinking water utility. So I'll cover some of these here just to give you an idea as to um, how big and, and what we do within each of those lines of business or utilities as we call them. Um, 
Drinking Water First is a, about 1.5 million people uh, receive water that SPU uh, produces from our two drinking water reservoirs up in the mountains. Uh, average usage is about 118 million gallons per day. A uh, quick kind of fun fact is during the last uh, heat wave that we had, that the record heat over two days where we broke the record on back-to-back -back days, uh, we used 220 million gallons on that uh, Monday when it got really, really hot. So you can see kind of the, the, the differences between kind of our average kind of winter and then on a really, really hot day, what people consume and what people use to make products and things like that. Uh, of that average of 118, about 43% is sold to kind of retail customers, mostly within the city of Seattle, and then about 51% sold to wholesale customers. And those are usually cities or water districts outside our service area uh, that we actually provide water to as well. Um, so 7 million gallons a day of non-revenue water, that's one that doesn't go through meter, whether it's leaks and things like that. And overall, we have 1,823 miles of pipeline. And often that's kind of a shocking um, number for people. But if you think about the pipes that have to go under each street um, to get to your service that comes into your house or business, um, that, that's kind of the total right there. Uh, we have about 31 billion gallons of water supply storage at two mountain reservoirs, one up past North Bend at the Cedar uh, Falls facility, Chester Morse Reservoir, and then uh, one out past kind of um, Carnation Duval Monroe up there called the Tolt Reservoir. Um, we have 325 million gallons of treated water storage, and that's your traditional reservoir that might be buried or, um, you know, above ground, um, like tanks and things like that. And we do have three small groundwater wells uh, that are located down near uh, SeaTac Airport that we can use to augment our water supply if we need to or an emergency uh, conditions to add a little bit more supply. But they don't have nearly the supply that uh, we do up in the large reservoirs. So those are our main, main uh, places that we get our drinking water. Cruising along here, we have drainage and wastewater. Um, drainage is a storm drain, storm outfalls, 485 miles here. We're really talking about inside the city limits. Uh, we also take care of a lot of the creeks. There's about 40 miles of creeks within the city limits, and you can see kind of the numbers there for ditches and culverts. And we are installing more and more green stormwater infrastructure, um, flow control facilities. These are things like detention and treatment ponds. And then uh, there's water quality type structures that either filter or slow down water so it doesn't become turbid and take some of those things out of there. Uh, so that's the drainage side. On the wastewater side, um, 368 miles of sanitary sewers. Um, you know, these are uh, combined or sanitary. This is where you flush your toilet and you actually have, you know, human waste traveling, uh, you know, downstream in the pipes to uh, our conveyance system and then down to King County uh, wastewater. So that's something important to know. Um, you know, on the drinking water side, we take it all the way from the mountain lakes and bring it all the way to your faucet. On the wastewater side, we've got a really important partner. So we collect the, the drainage and wastewater and whatever goes into the sewer system is actually transported to a King County facility where they treat that uh, and then either recycle, reuse it, or then put it back into the waterway. So, uh, just a few numbers on that. We'll move on to solid waste. So this is the last one here. Um, and this is, you know, your yard waste, your garbage, your recycle. So, um, you know, uh, I think this is a little bit older, but from 2020, uh, and then we have the 2019 figures called out, 110,891 tons of commercial garbage, and then a little bit more, almost 120,000 tons of residential garbage. Uh, and then when you take your stuff to the dump or the transfer station, that accounted to 97,320 tons of self haul garbage. And that includes, uh, you know, some of the contractors that are building and doing construction waste as well. Um, you know, we have a recycling rate uh, up there as well. Uh, and then you can kind of see down there how many folks uh, we use uh, that, that use our services for solid waste uh, and kind of move along there. So I, I wanted everybody to realize, you know, often we're associated with uh, drinking water. Uh, if folks don't confuse us with our, um, you know, sibling uh, utility over there at Seattle City Light, but uh, drinking water, drainage and wastewater and solid waste are the things that Seattle Public Utilities is responsible for. So I'll keep cruising along here, do a quick time check to make sure we're staying on track. Um, so when we talk about earthquakes, uh, we have three of those utilities and all of them will be significantly impacted. And I'll talk a little bit later about how we prioritize some of these things, but some of the impacts that impact drainage, wastewater, solid waste, and drinking water is that uh, we know that the most important asset that we have uh, will be severely impacted in a large quake. And that's people, 
Um, and that's the community. It's also our staff that live in and around our service area. Uh, and it's the people that get on the trucks and operate the systems and monitor and make sure that the, the drinking water system is safe. Um, also our buildings, we have a control center um, that's located down in Soto. We have auxiliary control centers and, and kind of parallel system control centers uh, in different parts of the city. And all of those are in buildings, right? And depending on the, the resiliency of those buildings, those can be impacted as well. Uh, our access to our equipment in warehouses, uh, our vehicles as well. Um, all of these things can be damaged. Um, and then vital records and systems. We know that uh, when a significant quake happens, networks, communications uh, are all at risk of not being available um, as well. So that's internal to our network, uh, I, like I'm talking about right now. And then I'll talk a little bit about partner infrastructure in a second. But, uh, and then the, the big thing where we have a lot of things that we're gonna need to fix and, and take a look at are our infrastructure assets. That's pipes, pumps, our dams, uh, culverts, test basins, valve systems, uh, and all of those, those things that connect them, whether it's electrical or, or mechanical. Uh, so lots of things can be damaged by an earthquake, and this is kind of just across there. You can kind of see some of the impacts. Um, and then a really big deal to us is limited or no access to our partner, partner critical infrastructure. Uh, a lot of our systems, pumps, our, our um, computers and, and control systems are powered by uh, energy, right? So that's why I'm really close with our, our uh, the other departments like Seattle City Light and Brittany and I talk on a regular basis and you'll hear from her in a second. Uh, but when one of our systems goes down, it has cascading impacts to uh, the other systems as well. And we'll talk a little bit about it later, but I know if you went to some of the previous uh, presentations, you talked about the fire department, or uh, you talked to or heard from the fire department. Clearly, after a large earthquake, fire is on everybody's mind, and we got to get those fires out right away. So we plan to prioritize those. So, um, you know, as much as we rely on the transportation network and our, our partners at Seattle City Light, we know that the fire department likes to, as they put it, put the wet stuff on the red stuff, and they can't do that without us. So we need to really plan and be prepared to, to prioritize their response and, and meet their needs as well. So cruising along here, just a quick map. I know this is really detailed here, um, and I don't know if you can see my mouse up there, but you can see north on the map, the Tolt Reservoir, and south a little bit more is the, the Chester Reservoir. You can see these major pipelines that come uh, you know, down the mountains, through kind of the suburbs, and then up into the city of Seattle to fill up our reservoir. It's what we call a regulating basin. And there's pipes that come all the way down through the city. On the cedar side, we have um, a dam, the Chester Morris Masonry Dam up there, um, and that controls the flow in the Cedar River for fish and people and recreators and all of that, and Seattle Public Utilities and Seattle City Light coordinate that together. Uh, but we actually don't have pipes that start up there. Um, there's actually a Landsberg Diversion Dam further down towards Ravensdale that takes the water out of the river in a big pipe called the Penstock and fills up Lake Young uh, down there in Fairwood in Renton. And from there, we treat the water and then uh, pipes bring it into the city and fill up our reservoirs and it comes to all of your faucets there. Uh, in addition on this map, you can see a lot of faults. You can't see the big one out there, which is, you know, hundreds of miles offshore, which is the Cascadia subduction zone that we hear about a lot. Um, even more impactful for us is the Seattle Fault, and you can see that running right through the, the, the city there, uh, right on I-90, and that's something that can cause a lot of damage for us as well. So uh, we know that there's a lot of earthquake hazards, and we, we, you can see here kind of how our system on the drinking water side is overlaid there. Um, so I'll talk about some of the impacts. Uh, just in general, um, to the different utilities that we have. On the drinking water side, um, you know, anytime you have an earthquake, um, one of the things that really messes things up for people that have buried infrastructure like, like um, Seattle Public Utilities is you have the ground moving. And it would be actually a little bit better if the ground moved in the same direction all at once, right? Because then all your pipes and assets are kind of moving together. Uh, but we have something that's called ground displacement um, or differential flip that happens in different areas of the city. And what happens is that at a certain point, just kind of like a line or a plane, uh, you have one part of the ground going up or sideways or diagonally, and the other <laughs> part of the ground right there uh, goes the other direction. The problem for us is that our, our buildings, our buried infrastructure and stuff like that, uh, they go right through those planes. Um, so it, it breaks it. And that's why we have so many breaks on all of our buried assets when we have an earthquake like that. Um, 
other things besides just things breaking, right? Damage to our treatment. And that's where we make the water, uh, either at Lake Young or up near the mountains by the Tolt. Our storage, these are reservoirs, whether they're buried or tanks or standpipes, our transmission pipelines, and then the smaller pipes that actually bring the water down the street to your house. All of those are gonna be severely impacted by a large quake. Uh, many customers will be without water for a significant amount of time. And often people say, well, how long will I be without water? And we kind of know what the worst case scenario is, right, for certain parts of the city there. But all of this really depends on where you're at, where the earthquake happens, how deep it is, and where the impacts that we see are. Um, but we do say that it, it could be weeks, like two weeks. Um, or even a little bit longer for some of our customers without that regular, you know, I'm going to turn the tap on and water is going to come out. And then once water is actually at your house or your, your place of work, your business and all of that, um, we anticipate that there's going to be extended boil water advisories that are going to be in place, which means you either have to boil your water for a minute before you drink it, a rolling boil, or you've got to treat it in some other way using bleach or, or filtering it with something like that. And we can talk a little bit about some resources to help you figure out what the best uh, kind of solution for that for you would be. So feel free to put that in there. I may not know exactly what you're doing, but we do have water quality folks that can help you offline maybe after this as well. So we've got some contact information for that in the resource piece that Tay's gonna, if she hasn't handed out or, or sent out, is gonna be doing uh, very soon. Um, so real quick on the, the drinking water side, we did a seismic study uh, on our water system. Um, and it kind of told us what we knew. Uh, and then for a catastrophic earthquake, the type of earthquake that has a 15 to 20% chance of happening in the next 50 years, and we looked at the Cascadia subduction zone quake as well as the Seattle fault, um, we know that we're likely gonna lose the Cedar and Tolt transmission systems, those big pipes that kind of bring uh, the drinking water from our two main reservoirs up in the mountains to the city. Loss of the east side supply line is likely, that's our uh, friends over in Bellevue. There's a larger supply line that, that services some of our wholesale city and water district customers over there. So just to talk about, um, you know, when you think of a water main breaker, you see it on the news and the, it, you know, breaks horizontally uh, and there's lots of water shooting up in the street, sometimes very dramatic. Every once in a while, CNN will pick one up and, and show it because it, it looks like a lot of water. It's a giant fountain. Um, for a Seattle fault zone scenario of a magnitude seven, that they're gonna have 2000 uh, water main breaks like that. For a magnitude nine Cascadia subduction zone scenario, plus or minus 1400. And this is just a model, right? And models are, uh, give you an idea, but they're never actually right when the thing happens. But this is kind of what we're looking at, expecting and planning for. Um, what we did find is that most of our terminal reservoirs remain functional. These are those buried reservoirs, many of them new, um, you know, they're, they're still serviceable. Those new ones are built with seismic standards in mind. A lot of over a dozen critical facilities, and that means either buildings, warehouses, um, treatment, in in town treatment um, locations and things like that. Uh, and so when it gets really bad like that, um, we're looking at a loss of water pressure throughout our direct service area, meaning the city of Seattle, in about a day, 24 hours, which means um, just to put it bluntly, you turn the faucet on or the bathtub and you try to take a shower and nothing comes out. Um, so that's where we're at with that. And we can talk a little bit about how we prioritize and kind of restore the system in a bit here. On the drainage and wastewater side, broken side sewers and sewer mains, damaged overflow and detention facilities, uh, loss of the treatment capability from one of our most important partners, King County Wastewater Treatment Division, and then sewage servicing and roadways on private property, hazardous materials overflowing into water bodies, just basically a mess, right? An environmental and public health mess. Um, if a lot of this stuff is going uh, into our waterways. So expect beaches to be closed, uh, expect um, you know sewage flowing in the street, and then also um, to remember to kind of stay away from that type of stuff. Uh, if you see a sign or you see sewage in the, in the right of way around a property, um, it's never something that you want to get mixed up in until it's been uh, you know, repaired correctly and, and, and cleaned up. On the solid waste side here, um, we're talking about damage to our transfer stations, the dump, and our contractor facilities that take our recycled materials and other things like that. Um, a lot of the transportation networks that haul waste away, uh, rail and roadways, and then a huge amount of debris that needs to be cleared, stored, sorted, and removed to make sure that people can get around the city and that we can get this waste and debris from the earthquake actually removed to actually retake the space back for recovery operations. 
Seattle Public Utilities is actually accountable in the city of Seattle for making sure that we have a debris management plan uh, that talks about the different phases and how we operate to, to help clean the city up. And the Seattle Department of Transportation uh, and some large um, consultants and contractors from uh, kind of a national level that do these things help us get that done uh, after a quake because of the amount of resources that, that are required to actually clean things up. Um, so overall, Seattle Public Utilities has incident management priorities. And for those of you that have uh, talked about this before or heard from other departments, we use the incident command system and a critical part of that, and we talk about this a lot, whether we're responding to COVID, a water main break, um, you know, a winter storm or a flood, uh, right off the bat, we ask, how is this incident impacting life safety and public health, right? And those impacts need to be taken care of first. Right. Then we talk about incident stabilization, and that's kind of um, emergency or incident management speak for how do we not let this thing get worse? How do we kind of put boundaries on this, put a perimeter on this, uh, and make sure we're not doing any harm to make the, the situation worse than it is as well? And for Seattle Public Utilities, we talk about environmental and property protection and then maintaining public trust. So if our water is not safe to drink, you can expect to hear from us right away uh, on the news, on the, on the radio, on Alert Seattle, on the web. Um, so things like that are how we respond. So uh, I'll put a plug in here, and I'm sure Tay and, and, and Matt would, would like to get this up there too. If you haven't signed up for Alert Seattle yet, please do so. And then for City Light and Seattle Public Utilities, please click that checkbox and opt in to the utility alerts, because that's a great way to hear from us on whether or not uh, your garbage is going to be missed or, uh, you know, we've got... Uh, well, well, we have lots of different ways to contact you if we need you to boil your water, but uh, you'll be able to hear from us about a lot of different things. Um, so we use these priorities to prepare for and respond to incidents. There we get going here. Um, and then I'll briefly talk about damage assessment. Uh, so there, there's two things that happen when an earthquake occurs. First is that rapid operational response, that initial response to an earthquake for our crews that are on duty, whether it's two o'clock in the morning um, or it happens during business hours when everybody is up um, and our, our operations crews are in the, in the city, uh, that's on autopilot, right? They respond to things coming into dispatch that they see on site that happen to come through. If it's still up, our SCADA system, which stands for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition, that's all the instruments and networks that we have to um, see what the water system and the drainage and wastewater system is doing. Uh, we have crews in the field. We also have a large integrated security system that we can look at our assets on to kind of look at damage. And that applies to dams, reservoirs, pump stations, building assets and all of that. So that stuff all happens as part of what our trained emergency responders do. They do this on a tiny scale every single day. Uh, the water main breaks in your street, um, you might notice or somebody knows, and then all of a sudden a, a blue and white truck shows up. There's a bunch of workers on it with a backhoe. They dig the street up, they fix the pipes, they um, you know, bury it, and then they repave the street and, and it happens a lot. We just have to do a lot of that after an earthquake. In addition to that, with uh, the, the size of the system that SPU has in the three different utilities, we've developed a damage assessment plan. So this runs parallel to that initial operational response. And what we do is we have trained damaged assessors. It's about 80 to 90 of them at any given time. They mostly come out of engineering, but some operational folks as well. They're dispatched on specific routes. Um, to identify, to go out and actually take a look at and inspect um, pre-identified critical assets that are ranked for inspection and reporting. So we can start to tell the story of our entire system. We don't have to rely on just the operational response, which has the important job of just putting out fires as fast as they come up. We start to refocus our resources uh, on kind of the bigger picture um, to try and, and, and get our arms around uh, what we need to do as quickly as possible. We keep cruising along here. So this is the damage assessment timeline. The initial operational response starts right on the left side of this slide, right away after it happens, no matter what time. Um, the damage assessment plan is going to start about 12 to 24 hours later. So uh, just to give you all kind of an idea as to how long it takes to mobilize some of those folks, uh, we don't want to send people out uh, into debris the night, like if this happens at night while it's dark, we'll definitely wait until at least kind of first light, right, the next daytime hours to deploy those, those trained damage assessors on that route. 
So how SP responds in general, um, using incident command system. And uh, if you haven't heard about this yet, it's just a, an organizational management system, just like project management that Matt and Brittany and Michelle from Seattle City Light and our partners at ESTA and our partners in the federal government and the tribes and everybody uses so we can speak the same language, right? Um, and then once we decide that an incident has occurred, this is something that we can handle with our regular business resources, our general manager, uh, or their designee, if they're out, assigns an incident commander to really box out the impact from that uh, and lead an incident management team to respond to the incident. Uh, an earthquake for us would be no different. We've practiced this when we do uh, big earthquake exercises like Cascadia Rising. So uh, the last time we did a Cascadia Rising um, exercise, and I know this is too small for you to read, but I wanted to kind of show you the org chart of what an incident management team looks like. These are actually real people that participated in an exercise, uh, but there's a lot of them. And this is just the folks that are helping organize Seattle Public Utilities response. And then we also identify the people that will go and coordinate with uh, folks like Matt and Tay at the City of Seattle's Emergency Operations Center. Um, so the incident management team is uh, responsible for taking care of the impacts of the incident, but they do that by also implementing plans. So I've listed a, a few of them up there. Seattle Public Utilities has a comprehensive emergency management plan, continuity of operations plan, which is super important to us during this last year with COVID, um, an emergency logistics plan. Uh, so these are kind of corporate utility-wide plans, and then we really get into some of the hazard or function or facility-specific plans. We have Emergency action plans related to a specific dam. Uh, the damage assessment plan I just described is up there. And then you can see uh, we have plans for what happens if it's cold, what happens if it um, you know, gets wet, uh, and kind of all those different things. But they use these as a tool in the box that the team can grab out and, and respond uh, and, and get started. Every incident is different, but this is kind of at least they have a tool in the box to get started. When we coordinate with our partners here, um, Seattle Public Utilities deploys uh, you know, what we call emergency operations center representatives to other city, uh, Seattle EOC, uh, or for us, you saw that our jurisdiction extends um, quite a ways into the county, and we have a lot of wholesale customers that rely on us for drinking water as well, uh, so we send a representative to the King County Emergency Operations Center too. Um, so those staff provide that critical link between our incident management team that are responding to the impacts to our system and our customers and our community uh, and um, kind of the overall city response. Like we call this a, a unity of effort um, and that's really what we're looking for. That way we support our partners and share kind of the whole story of what's happening with the incident uh, kind of all the time and continuously. In addition to that, uh, we work really closely with several regulatory agencies to make sure that our response is in compliance with kind of best practices and laws. I've listed some of the, the regulators we worked with, Seattle King County Public Health, Washington State Department of Ecology, and the State Department of Health, specifically the Office of Drinking Water. So all very important so that we meet the requirements of, of you know, the state health as, as well as like the Safe Drinking Water Act and as well as environmental regulations. Um, so our operational priorities here, uh, drinking water, uh, when it comes to impacts to the drinking water system, Right, I think it's really important for people to understand that the first thing that we're gonna try and do, especially post earthquake when gas lines are damaged, there's likely gonna be a lot of fire, is really prioritize our response to preserving um, or getting water to firefighters, trying to put out fires uh, or keep uh, you know facilities protected so they can rescue people and things like that. Um, and we do that uh, by maintaining storage at our reservoirs. So if the distribution system is broken downstream of a, of a buried reservoir, we may shut water off so that it doesn't all just leak out. Um, and then uh, there are um, places where the fire department can come and hook up and we kind of keep that water and, and then can access it for the things that we need it for. You know, after maintaining storage, we're gonna look at where do we need water for critical facilities? Uh, hospitals like, like Harborview and the other places that are gonna be taking an influx of, of, of patients. Um, perhaps, uh, you know, our, our friends at the Seattle Emergency Operations Center have set up a, a mega shelter to house people because uh, homes and apartment buildings are damaged and they need water there, so we'll prioritize a critical facility like that. And then at that point, we're actually looking at how to restore the system. Uh, and if you looked at the map and you kind of flipped it sideways from earlier, you can see that all of our water, most of it really comes downhill out of the mountains, right? So knowing that, 
right? We really want to start kind of uphill and kind of, we got to fix that transmission system from our treatment plants and work our way all the way back into the city. And that's what really takes a long time uh, on some of this. And there's some really bright people in our control centers and things that can do some really incredible things to move water where it needs to go. Uh, but they're going to be doing all of that and it's still going to take us a while to get water all the way back into the system. So uh, for the distribution system all the way into the city of Seattle. Uh, so that's that system restoration component. And then once we actually get water um, back in the pipes, uh, you'll be able to drink that water, but you'll have to boil or treat it. Uh, and then we look at uh, making sure that we start to, to retreat all that water. There may be flushing operations and things like that, but we'll notify you again when the water is safe to drink. But you can see that as we move through this, you know, getting drinking water out of the tap um, and kind of relative to some of these other priorities, uh, it is a priority and it's an important one, but it is lower than some of the other ones that you see up here in the bullet. Um, so we implement the plans, right? That uh, some of those ones that we talked about earlier, oh, let me go back one, um, to, to respond. There's a specific earthquake response plan, our drinking water system, pressure loss and water quality guide, a water shortage contingency plan, and an emergency water distribution plan. So I'll jump real quick to the drainage and wastewater side. Uh, really, we know that water for firefighting and then water to support public health um, is, is really important. So many of our resources, crews, um, expertise are going to be reallocated from some of our other utilities like drainage and wastewater to support the drinking water response so that we can make more repairs uh, and get things back up and running more quickly. Uh, also, there's going to be a tremendous spill response component of this because of sewage surfacing, hazardous materials that have broken open and spilled everywhere, and a lot of beach and waterway closures that they're going to have to grapple with as well. And some of the plans that we use there to get started are spill response plan and our overflow response plans and procedures. Last on the solid waste side, uh, I talked about debris management here. Debris management has two phases. Our partners at the Seattle Department of Transportation help us with phase one, which is get the debris off the critical arterials, much like they do with snow, and move it to the side. Then we start to collect it and sort it and bring in lots of national level resources to get it out of there. On the solid waste collection side, um, you know, we saw that the snowstorm um, back in 2019, um, the longest I think folks were uh, unable to get collected was about three weeks. And we found that that was pretty impactful. So um, we definitely think that it's, it's possible with a significant quake that solid waste collection is going to be uh, kind of a hard go for a while until our contractor haulers and, and others get up and running. Um, so there's some things you can do, especially if the sewer system is done, to store your um, you know, human waste in, in a safer way uh, and kind of keep it separate uh, as well. And then on, on this side, we've got some plans that they use, the debris management plan, uh, as well as our solid waste service interruption and communications plan. I'll keep cruising through here. Um, so a lot of that, Seattle Public Utilities has a, a large operational response capability. We can really handle a lot of things, but we are going to be overwhelmed in the case of a um, Cascadia subduction zone quake uh, or a Seattle fault zone or a significant quake that damages our systems, like I described, but, you know, up to 2,000 plus just water main breaks, and that's just one of our utilities there. Um, so our service is going to be severely interrupted afterwards. So we we ask for your help, um, and you can help your community here. And really, the, the main thing here is ensuring you have a robust emergency supply kit that can last for up to two weeks, and that you can communicate with your family and friends and neighbors. It's the best way that you can help. Uh, and there's some specific things here related to our services that are really important. First is emergency drinking water. And I've got our emergency drinking water system uh, sticker up here. And if we were in person, I would hand out a bunch of these. Uh, it says one gallon per person per day for three days. But really, uh, that first checkbox over there says, hey, try to store two weeks supply if you can. Um, I will say that if you want one of these stickers, uh, me and a couple members from my team will be down at the Duwamish River Festival on Saturday, and we'll have lots of these things and some other things to hand out uh, as well. So I've got a link up there, but a gallon per person per day. Uh, you know, if you're storing your own water, about every six months, if you bought your bottled water at, at Costco or someplace like that, they'll last a lot longer. Talked about not using milk, bleach, or glass containers. Glass doesn't hold up well when it falls off the shelf during a quake. So uh, lots to look at there. I know some of this is on the resource sheet, and I don't want to steal time from our partners, so I'll keep, uh, keep rolling along here. 
I want to note that Seattle Public Utilities does have an emergency water distribution system, and I'll show you kind of what that looks like in just a second. But even though we have the ability to take water and um, distribute it, and you can come and fill up a bag that we have, uh, it's not going to be enough for everybody. Um, so it's still really important for you to, to store and try to get to two weeks supply of drinking water on your own. Um, other agencies like the Red Cross, Salvation Army, and even the Army Corps of Engineers will show up and they'll really increase the amount of emergency drinking water, but that takes time. It can take days. And for some of these resources, especially those coming from the Department of Defense, it can take a week or so. Um, so just keep that in mind as we go along. Um, just really quickly, I know this is too small again, but you can kind of look at the, the pictures. Um, really, the, the basis of our emergency water distribution system is it's a, a manifold, which basically means um, we take what uh, is right kind of up here in this trailer and hook it up to what's called a hardened hydrant or an emergency supply connection that's not supposed to break during an earthquake. Uh, and we can take that and fill up lots of uh, bags of water for everybody to take. You can kind of see the small picture there. Um, we also have the ability, if needed, to fill up one of these giant, you know, 3,000 gallon plastic bags or so with water. We can drive it around in the back of a cleaned out solid waste hauling truck, uh, but that's a lot harder. So, um, you know, depending on what's impacted and where it's needed, we can deploy this emergency water distribution system and get some water to folks. Um, but, you know, obviously, um, it's definitely not going to be enough to provide everybody with the amount of drinking water that they're going to need right after a quake. And it's going to take us even a little while to, to get our arms around this and deploy some of these things, at least probably a couple of days, uh, if not a little bit longer. Okay, so um, if the sewer system is out and you can't flush your toilet, and every time you flush your toilet, it comes up in your yard or your, your neighbor's yard, um, we, we want you to use um, kind of this emergency sanitation guide and uh, this and some other tips uh, and techniques for, for making sure you stay safe when your toilet doesn't work uh, are in the resource guide that Tay's handing out. Uh, but have your supplies on hand, it's basically a bucket uh, with plastic bags and garbage ties to make sure that nothing gets out of there, uh, chlorine, bleach, um, to make sure you can sanitize things and then soap for your hands and making sure you have good hygiene. So uh, this is out there, but it's how to build a makeshift toilet. Uh, this is one technique. There's a great kind of um, two bucket technique that's in there. Uh, I think there's a, a city of Portland resource that that Tay's handing out as well. Um, so that's in there as well. And with that, I guess I could probably not put this slide up because we're saving questions till the end, but I will hand it off to, I believe, uh, Michelle from Seattle City Light, who will uh, introduce herself and I'll go ahead and give control. Oh, it looks like Michelle's not here. Oh, there's Michelle, I see you now. I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off. Michelle, you could have control in just a second. And then I'll be back if there are questions later, but it was uh, great to talk to you, all of you for just a, a few minutes there. Hi, everybody. Um, can, you, can you see the slides? For some reason, the slides stopped showing on my screen. Just want to double check. Yeah, Chad, you might want to, oh, there you go. Okay. All right, now I see it's following me. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Michelle Vargo. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Seattle City Light. Uh, today, I'm joined by Brittany Barnwell, which I, th I think you guys can all see Brittany. I can see her on my screen. Brittany, do you want to say hi real quick? Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Brittany Barnwell, and I'm the Emergency Management Advisor for Seattle City Light. And then also joining me is my colleague, Maurice Anderson. Uh, Maurice is the director over our System Operations Center. And so Brittany is actually going to cover a couple of slides today. And then Maurice and I are happy to answer whatever follow up questions that we might have at the end of the presentation. So, um, yes, I'm covering for Seattle City Light uh, today and we'll move to the next slide. Sorry, just giving it a chance to react. Um, and our next slide, really, I was covering our values, um, our mission, vision, values for the city, uh, Seattle City Light, rather. And so our mission at Seattle City Light is to um, provide our customers with affordable, reliable, and environmentally responsible energy services. 
And if I will try clicking this one more time, I don't want the slide deck to. There we go. There we go. Slide deck to get a hold of uh, ahead of me here. And and our vision is to create a shared energy future, as many of you um, probably can understand. Um, our our landscape is changing in the utility industry. It probably doesn't look like what it did 100 years ago or even 50 or 20 years ago. And so we're continuing to adapt that by partnering with our customers and um, to meet your energy needs in, in whatever way you may choose, because obviously there's probably a lot more options for our customers than there have ever been before. And so we do that standing on our values of customer first, uh, environmental stewardship, equitable community connections, operational financial excellence, and safe and engaged employees. And so we can't do any one of those things without um, at least considering the other pillars of our values and, and completing our mission. So about Seattle City Light, we're pretty unique um, if you're in the utility industry in that we are a public uh, provider, so we're actually a municipal owned utility. And so what that means is uh, the citizens of Seattle and our service territory are actually our owners. And so um, that's not always the case for utilities. There's several different models, but that happens to be the case for Seattle City Light. Um, there are other large utilities that are municipal owned and um, such as uh, Nashville or Austin or Los Angeles. But for the majority, if you've lived any place else, you're probably more um, accustomed to um, a privately held company. And so, yes, we do have that fortunate um, arrangement here in the city of Seattle. So we are a city department. And so I'm pretty excited to, you know, not only answer to, um, you know, city council and the mayor, but also all the citizens of the city too. Uh, we are a net zero greenhouse emission city since 2005. So I think that's a pretty great way to lead. And as I mentioned, our environmental stewardship is something that we um, value very highly. And I think we um, we meet that intent, especially with meeting this goal back in 2005, when probably one of the first utilities to do that. And our population, uh, just, to, just a reminder, we don't only service the city of Seattle. We actually have other franchise cities that we are the public utility for. And so I've got those franchise cities listed below. Um, they're also located on the map. Yeah, I see that box too. I'm not sure. Is there something, if anyone knows what I should do to get rid of that, you can let me know. We might want Chad to just stop sharing and reshare and, and just refresh real quick. So. Okay. All right, looks better now. So then if we give control to Michelle, maybe we'll be back on track. All right, I think it's working. Oh no, now it did it again. Hey Michelle, do you just want me to reshare it again and I can click the slides when you need me to if it's- Sure. Again, okay. Well, it went away. Yeah, once I stopped controlling it, we gave it back. How's it look now? Looks good for my end. OK, so you can just let me know or I'll try and uh, read the cues here and keep us moving along. Yeah, so let's go to the next slide. All right, so what are our energy resources and then what are the loads? Um, so for uh, City Light, we actually have seven own dams. So we have generating facilities where we're actually producing power um, for the system. And so if you look at the map on the right hand side, those seven dams are, are represented by those blue dots. And so if you're familiar with the area, um, the greater Washington area, um, then we've got the Skagit River system, which we've got Ross Dam, Diablo Dam, Gorge Dam, and New Halem. And that's flowing from upriver to downriver. So the lowest dam being New Halem as it flows west 
uh, towards the coast. And then actually our largest producing dam is on the very far east side of the of the state, and that's our boundary dam. And it's pretty close to the Canadian border over there. Um, and then really close in town, and you heard Chad talk about this a little bit, we, we have a kind of a co-arrangement with SPU in that SPU has um, a water source at these locations, and we use that water source to also produce electricity um, if the conditions are, are available to do that. And so we have those two dams located at um, South Fork Tolt and Cedar Falls. And Cedar Falls was actually one of the original dams uh, built to uh, produce power for the city. So it's a very old, um, old generating facility. Really, really need to go out and look at the history there. And same thing with the Skagit. If you guys have never been out to the Skagit River Valley, um, we actually do tours in the summer highlighting our hydro project out there. And there are there are um, shorter tours out at Boundary Dam too, but certainly these are all areas that you can get out and look at and um, be fascinated by the the um, the the equipment that we own and operate to produce our power. So, and then the other um, items on the map you'll see are the the High Ross Agreement. That's can that's um, power produced in Canada that we can purchase power from Canada um, based on that agreement from the water flowing um, down the river from Canada. And then we have other long term contracts uh, you can see there and uh, that are both represented by the black diamond and then the yellow square. And so obviously all of the stuff that um, all of the assets that City Light operates, they're all hydro powered, but because we produce um, we, we um, purchase power on the open market. We also have a mix of um, different power power uh, sources in our portfolio, and that's represented in that lower right hand donut uh, shape there that you can see what what probably makes up all of the power that we we produce for our customers. And so, but obviously anything that City Light is producing is hydropower. We just might actually purchase something else. And so it didn't come out in these slides as well as I would have liked, but on the bottom left hand side, there's a loads part of this. And so I just wanted um, to just highlight for folks, especially recently with the big heat wave that we had, uh, we got a lot of questions about, you know, what was our peak load? What is our base load? All of that. So on a daily average, and this is across seasons, so um, just on average, uh, the daily load is about 1200 megawatts. Uh, we are a winter peaking utility, and I think we're one of two utilities in the whole country that are winter peaking. Um, it's pretty unique for a utility to be winter peaking. Typically, the summer, the air conditioning um, really draws on, on the system quite a bit. And so we are winter peaking, and our winter average is around 1,210 megawatts. We've seen a peak, and this is back in 1990. I think a lot of the efficiencies that we've seen in technology and heating technology and conservations and things like that have drawn that number down quite a bit. But in 1990s, we saw a winter peak of uh, 2,050 megawatts. On average, our low season if it would be either the fall or spring, and we're usually seeing uh, 1,025 megawatts. And in the summer, our average is 940 megawatts, but we just recently just saw in this summer that we saw a peak of 1,533 megawatts. So again, that is was supposed to be on the slide. Sorry, I have to read it to you. But in general, as you can see, our capability of producing 2,000 megawatts, all of those numbers are less, um, but certainly we want to be conscious of the fact that because it's a hydro resource, hydro resources are seasonal. And so traditionally where you see hydro resources being built in Washington, we um, typically have a lot of resources available after the spring runoff. So the snow pack builds over the winter and then it melts and then we have a lot of water available to us to produce water. So there are certain times of the year where that all of our hydro resources are not available to us, the capacity that you see on the charts. And so then we would be buying power on the market. And therefore, since we're a part of a greater system, we just need to be aware of what our peaks look like. And then if we're not producing to meet that peak, then we what contracts do we have available to us and pull from the system? So um, next slide, please. So how do we get water from our hydro resources to your house? So this picture 
there's a little cartoon at the top and it's got um, some numbers that you can follow along with me. So number one, that's our, our beautiful dam. We'll say that's the Skagit, um, that's the Ross Dam. It actually looks more like Diablo if you've been out there. So we'll say it's Diablo Dam. And so obviously the water pushes um, pushes down through uh, the powerhouse and spins the turbine. It generates electricity. Um, and then the substation transfer steps up. So number two, that's going to be a substation that's actually at the generation site. And so that substation has the responsibility of making sure that the electricity is in a form that it can actually be transmitted long distances over a transmission tower. And so the transmission tower or, you know, you're going on that long cross country trip with your family and occasionally you'll see the string of transmission towers much different than the kinds of poles that you see in your local neighborhood or something like that. So the transmission towers receive the energy from the generation source and the substation uh, generation substation and then transmit transmits the electricity towards a population that needs that electricity in a form that they can use it in it gets to in our case gets into town hits one of our substations and that substation then has another responsibility to step it back down where it can be pushed out to the the local community over our distribution. So transmission is kind of trying to push through a lot of um, electricity in a channel. And then once it gets to distribution, you're kind of breaking that down. Does it need to be in the same format? Kind of dangerous to push it out in that format. So we break it down into distribution and it's pushed out through these distribution poles. And so if you're out in your neighborhood and you've seen these wooden poles in your, in your area, that's what we're talking about with the distribution lines. Um, and then there's actually another transformer on the other end of the pole typically could be on that pole. Um, and then if you have underground services, you might see a transformer outside your local cul-de-sac or whatever that might be. And that's going to step it down even farther so you can use it in your house without damaging the things in your in your home. So that's the way that we get electricity from the dam um, into your home. And so just a quick uh, check in on our assets that we have. Um, we have about 112 or 112,500 poles in our system, which, uh, you know, for those that have been around a while, every you'll occasionally cars hit poles. Um, there are also a lot of poles to maintain. And so we, we do have a project where we try to make sure all the poles are inspected and make sure that we are prioritizing the poles that need to be replaced because obviously they can prevent a uh, safety hazard if they're not. And so we have to maintain all those assets. Um, also the transmission. So in both the transmission and distribution cases, um, cases you can have either overhead or underground. Uh, and so this is just a representation of how much we have each. I can tell you that during an earthquake, um, typically the underground services are more susceptible to the types of activities that you'll see. Um, kind of like Chad was talking with your your water system. If you got like a rigid conduit in our case, in many cases when we have underground services, they might be in a conduit and that those rigidness of the, the conduit can make them susceptible in the earthquake to um, um, cutting or shearing. And so um, obviously that's a real risk. And the overhead, they tend they tend to perform pretty well in earthquakes, especially transmission towers. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about um, really the risk that we see with transmission towers are landslides. So really the foundation underneath the towers are more susceptible to the earthquakes and the towers themselves. Um, yeah, okay, and so next slide. So the, oh, this is Brittany, so I'm gonna pass it over to Brittany. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, just a little brief uh, intro about our emergency management program. Uh, Seattle City Lights emergency management program consists of four high level components to maintain adequate readiness for our customers. And they are the incident management team, disaster declarations, um, incident command system training, and last but not least, our public communications tool, Alert Seattle. Our incident management team consists of 200 plus city employees who are trained and ready to respond in the time of crisis. Within the incident management team, we have five sections and they are the command team, operations, logistics, planning, and finance and admin. 
federally declared disasters are also managed under, emer under the emergency management program. Pre and post of the disaster, Seattle City Light keeps track of all damages to equipment, time and labor, material costs, and much more. This information is important to the, federally, to the Federal Emergency Management Agency and to the City of Seattle as we try to return to pre-disaster conditions. The Incident Command System training is training pushed down through the Federal Emergency Management Agency for persons working under the Robert T. Stanford Disaster Relief and Emergency Management Act. Training includes the introduction to the Incident Command System, Basic Incident Command System, the Intermediate Incident Command System for Expanding Incidents, Advanced Incident Command System for Command and the General Staff, and also the introduction to the National Response Framework. And lastly, uh, we have our Alert Seattle, which is our awesome communications tool we use to inform and update our customers and employees at any time. And just for an overall general picture, uh, SCL's emergency management supports operations by being the point of contact and the liaison between Seattle City Light and outside agencies. Next slide, please, Chad. Our incident management team is broken down into three locations. Um, Seattle City Light's downtown core, who supports all operations and planning efforts pertaining to City Light, and we and our two remote sites, which are known as the Skagit Hydroelectric Project and the Boundary Hydroelectric Project. Both locations have the capability and tools to manage their own incidents, but with definite backup and support from City Lights IMT from the downtown core. Next slide, Chad. SCL has four major plans they look at for guidance during an event. And they are the continuity of operations plan, which describes the efforts Seattle City Light takes to ensure during an any natural or man-made disaster, the continuity of essential positions are maintained. SCL services over 955,000 residents in a 131.31 square mile radius. We also employ over 1,800 employees, full-time workers, including the two hydroelectric plants. Next up, we have our all hazards response and restoration plan. This plan provides policy and procedures for Seattle City Light's response to any man-made or natural event that could severely damage City Light's capability to deliver power within its service area. Next up, we have our recovery plan. The recovery plan applies to all man-made and natural disasters and the recovery activities, and it's adaptable for different levels for recovery needs. It's, it leverages partnership and collaborations with our stakeholders. And last but not least, our mitigation plan. And our mitigation plan emphasizes our own operated facilities, infrastructures, and natural disaster with efforts to determine effective strategies for managing any risk of terrorism. Next slide, please, Chad. And the Seattle City Light Incident Management Priorities. Our four incident management priorities are there so we could power service to our customers, so we can think about restoration and power management, uh, property conservation, and public service. These four priorities are super important to City Light as we plan to prepare and respond to any outages within our community. Next slide, Chad. Back to you, Michelle. All right, so now um, a little bit more about our system. Uh, you know, we, we try to do a lot to make sure that we're as prepared as a utility, especially since we'll be part of the emergency response as we possibly can. And so um, knowing that earthquakes are a real hazard in our area, it's not a matter of when, um, or it's not a matter of if, it's when um, we will have an earthquake to deal with. And so we obviously take steps to make sure that our infrastructure is as prepared as it can be. So in 1993, um, we did a seismic study of all of our substations. And I, I, I think in that diagram, I explained to you the importance of the substation because we can't take 
um, the power in the form off the uh, transmission towers, it actually needs to be stepped down um, twice before it gets to your house. So obviously the substations play a critical role. So what is the status status of our um, substations if, if there was an earthquake? And so I believe Chad covered this a little bit. So the, the map that you can see there, the orange section is the liquid faction zones that are likely to occur during an event, an earthquake event. And so I've tried to match that as closely as I can with our substation map. So you can kind of get an idea of like where we think are, you know, we might have the most issues. And so obviously there are certain substations that we would pay more attention to than others. But aside from that, at the bottom, what you'll see is the risk assessment that we did um, during this study. And that study took into consideration, hey, what is the seismic zone? Because, you know, up in shoreline, the seismic might actually be slightly different than it is over in Magnolia or West Seattle. So it took into account this, the site location, and then also the geology of that area. What And what are the conditions in that area that we know about? So it took into into consideration things like liquefaction. And so of our 15 substations, it gave either a high, medium, low, or like a hybrid of a medium high. And uh, where that, where the substation, uh, the risk to the building. So if you've ever been in or around a substation, there's obviously a lot of electrical equipment out in the yard, um, but there's also always, almost always a control building in that substation, especially in our substations. Our substations tend to be, um, pretty big in size compared to um, some other utilities that might have smaller substations, um, but more of them. So we do have a control building in all of our substations. And so what is the risk to that building um, or any other buildings that might be uh, on that on that um, site? And overall vulnerability, that whole area, what are the other considerations for, for that site? Uh, and then what is likely the time to restore um, the power to that that facility and so we gave our the study the folks that helped us with that study gave us a rating for each of those and so the boxes that are showing up in green these are all actions that we've taken to move uh, a lower rating into a higher rating and so as you can see there's roughly probably like 30 to 40 percent of the, some of the deficiencies that we've tried to address um, there's still some concerns i mean just obviously looking at this one, the one that's still got three straight highs uh, is Canal. And the unique thing about Canal, if um, if you've ever looked at the way buildings react um, in an earthquake type of event, Canal is a very old building. It's a brick building. And so brick buildings don't tend to be very resilient in an earthquake just because they're very rigid. And then also the other thing that doesn't help is if you have an old brick building with an annex of any sort, so any sort of addition to the building that might not actually act like one piece of um, one piece of uh, solid system, it's actually actually acting as two solid systems. So they might actually interfere with each other during an earthquake. And so you have some of that activity going out at Canal that we, we haven't been able to address. Um, but other than that, you can still see that um, we are making every effort. And the other thing to remember too is in a substation, you might have something like four transformers, two buildings or something like that. We obviously can't do everything at once. So we try to tie these upgrades into other activities. In some cases, we might have equipment that's 40 or 50 years old in the substation. If we're replacing that equipment anyway, we're probably gonna go ahead and say, hey, now is the time to add some reinforcement to that building because we're doing this. Let's make sure that we're doing it in the most cost-effective manner as possible. And of course, we're trying to maintain some urgency knowing that we wanna make sure our system is resilient resilient as it possibly can be. And the one, set, and the one site that you can see is all straight lows. That's our Denny substation. Our Denny substation is brand new. It was not um, completed in 1993. So good to see that right now that it would get a rating of a low, low, low because it has the advantage. We got to um, purchase modern materials, incorporate modern seismic design into that into that site. And so we would see if we were building new substations that we would be able to adapt to the new codes. But of course, dealing with the old infrastructure that we have in C City of Seattle, we will continue to chip away at this chart and make sure that the system is resilient. Next slide, please. All right, so this is a, 
this is out of a um, a uh, seismic uh, structural engineering book, so I will do my best to to share what what this is trying to represent here. But either way, Seattle City Light, we have structural engineers on staff. We're very lucky to have them. They're very talented um, employees. Uh, I really love their energy. I love their passion for their work. Um, and you'll see here in a little bit how how we use them um, for the community, uh, not just for the utility. But uh, so what we have done is with those uh, resources, we've tried to build a long term plan for resiliency. And so that's actually building out like policy. So what does the policy do for us? It standardize, standardizes our building designs. Um, so hopefully we're not starting from scratch every single time and there and therefore we can kind of predict what sort of um, controls that we're putting into the design and what our infrastructure should be able to adapt to. Um, ordering spare parts um, and equipment certainly helps that if we're incorporating this into our design that we can get that those same types of pieces of equipment. People can become familiar, they can be trained on it. Um, all of those things are great benefits to having a policy and building this standardization into our, our equipment. And so the last bullet, the objective, I say the essential hazardous. Um, so if we move over to the right hand side and we talk about this chart for a little bit. So on the top, we have the earthquake performance and on um, the earthquake performance, we're talking all the way that that you hope that your facility will be operational. Um, all, all the way to you're just hoping the building doesn't collapse on itself. And so unfortunately, um, clap, like just hoping that the building's not going to collapse on itself is not an acceptable performance measure for most engineers nowadays, especially what we do know about earthquakes. And so we're never really aiming to be on the right hand side of the chart. We're always aiming to be at the left hand side of the chart where we're actually aiming for higher than just life safety design. We're hoping that the building is going to be able to be reoccupied and be reused to for response and then hopefully it's operational. And so that's what that's what the performance level for the facility that we're aiming for. So we're on the left hand side of the chart and then on the vertical part of the chart we're talking about earthquake hazard level. And so obviously the bigger the earthquake should happen less frequently and so and they should be rare and then the frequent ones should be like the smaller type events um, and not as impactful so we, we obviously can't prepare for the very rare ones and be operational that would just imagine the amount of money that you would have to put into the design of everything that you're doing it's just not super cost effective to aim to design to that lower lower left hand box um, obvious we wouldn't want to pay for all of those sorts all of those sorts of upgrades it would make everything very hard to build and then operate too so we're living in this world where there's some risk that we're taking but also um what we can design for what we can purchase all of that sort of stuff so we're trying to live in this the three green boxes and those three green boxes are you know essential hazardous objective and so we're above that life, life safety so we're saying hey we're not just saying we want people to survive but we actually want our especially since we're part of the emergency response we want to make sure that we can operate um, and we have a plan to operate we're resilient enough to operate and so that's where we're designing all of our infrastructure structure to land. So next slide, please. <clears throat> so what are we doing? What are some examples of this? So uh, for their SOC, so our System Operations Center, which my colleague Maurice, um, actually this is where he works, is our System Operations Center. Very critical to our business. Uh, we do have a backup system operations center. However, it would be very ideal that in an, an event that our system operations center would be uh, operational and, and able to be reoccupied after the event. And so we're actually just getting through a upgrade to that facility. And I just had gotten done talking about one of our substations that uh, older building had a bunch of annexes and the brick being an actual issue for that building. And so the SOC actually used to have a lot of brick on it also. So the left hand side, you can see where the contractor is taking off all the brick fascia to that building and they've replaced it on the right with like steel metal gauge. And so that makes the walls a lot lighter. And then in an earthquake event, it should be more being a, uh, more resilient 
to um, the bending and the flexibility that it would need to to be able to sustain itself through an earthquake. And so we've made those upgrades and there's other structural upgrades that we made to this building. This is just an example. So we really do feel like our SOC is in a much better position to um, survive an earthquake um, should it occur. So that's, that's an ongoing, we're hoping that project gets wrapped up in the next month. Really excited about that. And then in the substations, there's lots of different equipment in the substations. There's a couple of pictures here. So I talked about the control center. Control center is just like any other building. We talked about some of the concerns there. Um, interior equipment anchoring. So inside the control center, you have a lot of panels. Those panels contain things like relays and cabinets and um, things that are essential for the operations of things in the in the actual yard. And so making sure that those don't walk around in the buildings. For those of you that live in Washington State, you, you know about anchoring your, your hot water tank or whatever it might be. Same sort of idea. Making sure that the equipment that's essential for the operation of the of the substation, it sits still and an earthquake doesn't tip over. So we we obviously do those sorts of things. And then the equipment in the yard. So the equipment in the yard, great, great picture of this. So the bottom picture is a capacitor bank. And as you can see, it's probably heavier on top. And then at the bottom, you've got it on four poles. And so, you know, think about that thing shaking. Think about how much the anchors would have to resist either, either toppling or walking off that concrete. And so on the left hand side of that capacitor bank, you see a blown up picture of what we've done to one of the legs of that capacitor bank. And so that makes it more rigid, more stiff, more able to sustain the shaking and that equipment more likely being serviceable after the earthquake. And then the fourth bullet here, the transformer base oscillation. So we talked about the importance of the transformers. We got them at the generation sites. We have them at our substation. And of course, you've got them on your on the poles or either your, your underground transformer banks too. And so in the substation, the very big transformers. And so if those go down, they're very hard to replace. A transformer to order one can take anywhere from a year to 18 months sometimes longer and sometimes they're coming from overseas so they're not easily replaceable we do in some cases keep spare transformers so if we have a model that we have four of them in a trans uh, substation we might actually have a spare in some cases we don't um and so that we would design around that or we try to find spare parts for whatever gets broken but the interesting thing that we do do for the transformers is we call this the the um triple base isolation equipment and so the transformer on the, on the middle set of pictures, you see the transformer and on the right is actually, you'll see the concrete pad that the, the transformer is sitting on and that base isolation um, equipment is actually at the corner. And so what that piece of equipment does is that during an earthquake, you have this very critical, very heavy piece of critical um, equipment during an earthquake that will actually slide. So that whole flo floating concrete slab will float together above those four um, base isolation units and it will allow the transformer after all the shaking is done to um, go back to its original position. And so you see this sort of technology in Chile, uh, New Zealand, in many cases, new uh, stadiums and other big um, public gathering places, they'll include this type of technology in its design. And so we've uh, made an effort to go ahead and put this, this um, technology into our substations. And, in, and that's all of our substations, so both our generation and our um, in-town substations. And again, it's not something that we can do all at once. We can't have a program to install this equipment on every single generate or transformer this year. But as we are replacing transformers, we are trying to incorporate this technology. So again, this transformer has the best um, possible um, chance of sustaining um, very minimal uh, impacts during the earthquake that would allow it to be operational. So that's what we're doing there. And then in the warehouses, so as you can imagine, it just as I said, if we've got a 40 year old transformer and it does, it doesn't have one of these or it just still sustains uh, um, deficiencies during the earthquake, we obviously need to have access to our warehouses and then our warehouses need to be able to 
uh, withstand the shaking during an earthquake and so that we can get to those spare parts. And so we're making structural improvements to our rack because even those pull top transformers at your home, even during a storm, if we were to have an earthquake and it took out all of our spare parts or all our backup transformers, we're no better for that either. So we need to make sure we're watching our warehouses, which we do. Next slide, please. All right, earthquake preparedness. So I've talked about the substations in town, some of the infrastructure in town, and because we do have generation sites, I wanted to talk a little bit about what we do for our seismic program out there. I have talked about the transformers already, and so we know that we have both of those in town and at the generation sites. So at the generation sites, we do have powerhouses, typically, especially for our generation assets, our powerhouses tend to be very old buildings um, and therefore very susceptible because just we know more about the design of buildings now than we did then. And so as we um, do upgrades into those buildings, we are incorporating um, stiffness and shear design into those facilities um, when, when the time allows and when uh, it makes sense. A uh, step up transfer, we talked about that. Switch yards, same thing. So same type of equipment that you saw um, with a capacitor bank or um, or um, the transformers in town. We're doing the same sorts of stuff in the switch yards out of the generation sites. Uh, communication towers, that could be in town or, or um, at the generation sites too. And we do have very critical battery assets at all of these locations. Um, and so those are another critical asset that we try to make sure that they're seismically upgraded uh, for these events. And so the dams themselves, uh, you know, if you keep an eye on the news, you've seen compromised dams and the amount of tension that they get and as they should get. And so we, they are all federally regulated. Most of I, we all of ours are, I should say that. And so uh, we meet all of the FERC requirements. We have um, mandated inspections. And so we have to make sure that we respond to any deficiencies as those inspections have. And so, and then we also have lots of devices that monitor the performance of the dam. Um, and if the dam is sensing any sort of activity that we might want to be aware of. And so we certainly have that part of our seismic program for the dams um, because obviously, uh, the structural integrity of those dams is really critical to not certainly the performance of our electrical system is not utmost, but certainly public safety. So next slide. So I mentioned the structural engineers that we have on staff. Uh, really great that our structural engineers really, um, they really thrive on the opportunity to share the unique the uniqueness of working for a utility and what seismic design can be incorporated to make sure that we can provide great customer service and resiliency to a critical system. And so we have partnered with the local um, schools and over 25 years have worked with 150 students. And these are examples of the project. So our structural engineers lead those projects, but of course we're giving real life scenarios, capstone projects to these engineering students so that they can have a chance to see real life application. Um, and usually when you're thinking about, you know, going into structural studies, you're probably not thinking about going to work for a utility. So I think this is a great program. Um, most recently, uh, one of the, um, you can see we're listing several of our, our um, generation and in-town assets, but most most recently we did the post 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 earthquake evaluation manual. And if you go to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more about that. So because it's really important that we're able to get back into our facilities and we have resources on hand that should be able to evaluate facilities, um, we do make sure that some of our staff maintain the ATC 20 trained um, inspection uh, status. And so what they are able to do is either do the rapid detail or engineering evaluation. Um, we do have some folks that are trained for the rapid and not and save the engineering evaluation for maybe our structural engineers. But either way, we do prioritize sending folks to this training. And with that training, um, as I mentioned, those students, they wrote a, a structural manual for each one of our locations in that what is most likely to be the control um, 
the most mode of failure for the the control building at whatever substation. And so the person that walks up to that substation has what the substation looked like beforehand, what most likely are going to be the failure modes, and then how can they inspect for that? So we've we've created this manual. It's a really great tool. It's just another example of us being proactive. And then, you know, again, working with the community to come up with a solution that makes us that much more prepared. And so, and then out of the dam site, have something sort of similar. At least we have some criteria about what we're going to do. So, you know, if it, I can't say we probably be even more conservative than this if there's actually a close, close um, earthquake. However, we these are the guidelines that we go by. Do we need to get someone out there to inspect the dam? We might contract that out, or we'll send our out our own engineers. And um, this is the criteria that we would try to prioritize that depending on the magnitude and the, the, the proximity to the dam. Next slide, please. So earthquake restoration plan and response. So for our transmission and distribution center, as I mentioned in the earlier in the presentation, the electricity system is not just Seattle City Light and our little sphere of influence. We're part of a greater system. And so obviously we have to coordinate with the utilities around us. And so that's why you'll see that first bullet is talking about our coordination with the, the RC West. Um, and those that plan is kind of laid out ahead of time. And so we we would submit that we would all agree on what actions that we would take. And so we would all do our part in making sure that we're acting as a system and we're not just, you know, worried about ourselves because actually it wouldn't do us any good because we're we only operate in a whole system. So we wouldn't be able to get the power straight down from one of our generation sites straight to the city without working as a system. So um, and then our prioritization as far as obviously can't provide power to folks without our substations being operational and that's why we spent some time talking about that just as chad talked about in the spu we have we will prioritize hospital and other other emergency facilities our, our water pump stations understanding that people are going to need water in that type of event and our communication facilities to um electricities and sometimes we have shared towers and things like that shared assets so we would prioritize those also uh, as mentioned in Brittany's part of the presentation, we have the continuity of operations plan. Our continuity of operations plan um, talks about the federal agencies that oversee the electrical system. So uh, the North American Electrical Reliability Corporation and then more regionally the Western Electrical Electricity Coordinating Council. Um, so and you kind of see some of this going on in different areas of the country that have other issues, not necessarily earthquakes but have capacity issues. And so, you know, that first bullet mitigating to the fullest extent possible the effect of the emergency on SEL's customer. So yes, we're going to take that in consideration, take, you know, always minimizing if, if we can get power, if we can reroute it, we will always do that. But if it's necessary, we're gonna implement emergency load curtailments um, and interrupting power. So like, you know, in the, down in California, you see a little bit of more of this. If we needed to do scheduled blackouts um, to make sure that we could provide electricity at least part of the day, we would do that. Um, or if we needed to make sure we needed to shut something down for a period of time just to make sure we could make safe, we would have to do that too. Um, and then the system you can't draw on more than it can produce and so otherwise you could damage even more equipment so it would be terrible to get through the earthquake um have the physical damage that could be done to the system and then overload it electrically and damage other things um, we wouldn't want to do that and so the third bullet's talking about that and that's all things that maurice and his team do does at the soc as much as we could possibly plan for every single scenario they would be trying to do this real time with the information that they have available to them so i mentioned here in this bullet with the uh, seattle fire department and sel Recently, we had a joint venture between the two departments where, especially in their downtown network. So on that slide where I listed our assets, so our distribution assets were overhead, underground, and then there was a network line in there too. So our network is a redundant system and our most critical customers tend to be on the network system. And there's a reason for that, like the hospitals, there's just more ways to connect them. 
um, to the electricity um, sources. And so um, in the network in particular, we started this joint venture with Seattle Fire Department in that we can actually play a little bit more offensive, offensive role um, in mitigating the impacts of a fire. So in the, in the past and in other cities, Typically, if there's an electrical fire in an underground service, you let it burn out and, and then you, you address the issue. In this case, you might be able to suppress the fire long enough with our coordinated plan and therefore be able to do some switching or turning things off. So there's less damage, less damage done to the electrical system in the event of a fire. And so more than likely, this team would be engaged in a fire. And I think that all of our efforts with the fire department ahead of time will make us more prepared for an event like that. And especially in the network where we would have most of our critical customers um, connected in the network. And then we also talk about inspecting, inspecting all the different kinds of equipment. And then I mentioned here hazardous, hazardous material spill response. So every single transformer we have and some of the other equipment that we have to um, all contain oil. In many cases, we've tried to move as close to as we can to environmentally friendly oil. Um, however, there still there are still equipment in our system that we would make sure we need to prioritize, and even the environmentally friendly stuff, we would still prioritize that cleanup. And so, even during major storms, this is still a big effort is our hazardous material spill response. And so, during an event like this, we would be making sure that we we get to all of our assets that have. Um, spilled um, hazardous material and getting in there and cleaning up and making that coordination. Next slide, please. All right, so I'm coming to an end here. Um, so for the generation sites in particular, as you can imagine, we have um, dictated response plans that we have. We we actually rehearse these. We do um, periodic uh, table table exercises so that we know what we're doing. Uh, we have specific charts, who's calling who, who's notified uh, in the event that there is a dam concern. So there's two different charts, um, one that failure is imminent. And so all of the local authorities and not even just local, even regional authorities would be notified that and how we get the word out to public agencies. So that's a chart. And then even if we're considering that there's a potential hazardous situation developing and we want to let folks know, we have a chart for that too. And like I said, this is something that we practice pretty regularly and so that we would be prepared in an event like this. And then at the generation sites too, all those transformers have oil um, as a part of their design. And so we would be actively involved in the materials, uh, hazardous material spill response out there too. This communication bullet, all I really wanted to uh, leave an impression with you is that we try to think through all of the possibilities that we can about having good lines of communication to all our critical infrastructure. And so, there's several different ways that we do that, and we're always trying to improve on that. Um, and so, you know, in some cases, we have direct lines to the SOC and things that we would be able to operate outside of maybe overloaded systems. Again, during these types of events, that's really likely to happen. I know it happened even with some of these systems in place during the squally, and I can talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. <clears throat> next slide, please. All right, so lessons learned. Um, we did take some lessons learned when we wrote our coop. Uh, there was a 6.7 magnitude in California that we had some lessons learned from. And even though back then in 1994 with the technology and the, the designs that we were using for seismic, uh, the transformers didn't sustain that much damage that they weren't operational. But they, what they did see is the anchoring points were compromised. So when I showed you that base isolation unit, kind of relieving that transformer of that stress by, by doing that upgrade to them. But good to know that most of the transformers performed well. Um, the power was restored to substations within 24 hours. That's a that's a good thing. Um, looks like the the steps taken. Uh, and I think we're always learning more from every single earthquake that that happens is because 
you never really know how these pieces of equipment, as you can see, they're funny shapes, um, designed pretty, you know, they're designed for the electrical system, not necessarily structurally first. And so we're we're obviously trying to meet in the middle as we learn more. And so good to see that the 1994 design that they were able to restore on um, the substation power um, that quickly. Um, if you've ever been in and around substations, they use porcelain. As you can imagine, porcelain like brick is, is not really great. It's great for not conducting electricity, but it is really poor for um, performance during an earthquake. So we do have a lot of that type of material in our system. So being aware of that, in many cases, that sort of damage didn't mean the equipment wasn't operational. So it's damaged. We got to go back and fix it, but there's probably uh, an ability to work with it in that in that um, in that state for a, for a while or a little while. Um, and this this parts being on hand. So our system ranges anywhere from having equipment that's you know, 60, 70 years old to, you know, we just replaced it last year. And so for the older equipment, having the spare parts on hand, that's usually going to be the hard part. In some cases, we might have two or three. And once we've gone through those, then you're talking about just having to buy a whole new piece of equipment. And so that's a real concern for all electric utilities. Uh, and I think as a uh, as utilities have faced whatever sort of disasters that they have in recent past is working together as a whole electric utility community. Um, I think our manufacturers understand the critical nature of our work. Um, we have mutual assistance, um, especially I had talked about um, kind of the assets in the beginning and what size um, our wire and our transformers are. We typically have a list of people that carry the same types of equipment, so we know who we're going to reach out first for mutual assistant if we need parts. Um, and of course, um, workers too. We have mutual assistants for workers set up, line workers, whatever it might be or whatever we might need, um, and then just other options. And then the federal agencies can also um, be enacted to help out in these types of scenarios too. So next slide. So Nisqually wasn't that long ago, and I, I had the unique opportunity to talk to two of the folks on my staff that lived through Nisqually. Um, both of them happened to be field workers at the time, and one was in an underground vault when this happened, and the other was actually digging, a, digging uh, in a pole uh, when this happened. And so really interesting to talk to them about lessons learned, uh, what that was like for them. Uh, they all recalled that communication was a complete uh, problem. Uh, they Nothing was working because everyone was trying to jump on the radios and phones uh, at the same time. And so the initial accountability was difficult. I think they just mentioned that, yeah, for the first hour, everyone was like kind of talking, waiting their turn. But after that, they were able to finally call through because we do have radio systems and they were able to get through and make sure that folks knew that they were safe. And at that time, they had the old Motorola phones, and it was one of the workers mentioned to me that it was interesting that their phone's walkie-talkie system worked when everything else wasn't working. So that was interesting. Um, for the folks that were downtown, the person that was in a vault mentioned to me that immediately everybody started coming outside the tunnel. So, you know, even though we might want to respond as fast as we can, we might actually just kind of be stuck in an area before we can get our resources in the area that we need to get them. And of course, in Seattle with the transportation routes, that could be an issue. And that was an issue that day too. They do recall trying to restore um, power to different parts of the city and having to take really long routes because not all the transportation routes were available to them. Um, and that's one of the good things about having our dispersed substations. So each of our substations are staffed. We do have a North and a South service center. So hopefully, um, we can get our resources where we need them during these events over time. Um, like I said, the transmission and the substations were mostly undamaged. At least they were operational, um, able to perform through any damage that was sustained. And with that liquid faction uh, map that I showed in the beginning, you saw a lot more of the liquid faction zone on the southern part of our territory. What we did see during this Nisqually, and of course this Nisqually came from the south too, is that the south end substation, all of the all of the equipment that we put to protect the system, a lot of those trips um, happened, and so they relayed out, and so all of that had to be restored uh, during the Nisqually, and most of that took place on the south end. 
And the other other parts, I think this is my last slide. The other parts that I would just mention for uh, lessons learned is like in New Zealand, uh, the big Christchurch uh, earthquake that they had underground services were mo the most compromised. And so like I had mentioned, the towers and the poles aren't usually susceptible, but the underground services they saw um, that 10, 15 percent of their services were out for about a month. And then um, BPA, also a big concern of theirs, if if you were been around since OSO, uh, the OSO landslide, it's not so much the earthquake, but they're worried about the landslides in our area. And so where where landslides are likely and we have transmission towers, that's where we need to be worried about the, the ability for the transmission towers to um, be operational after an earthquake. So all of those concerns, and I think those things are being mapped and thought about more um, by all of the surrounding utilities as we act as a system. So that's it for my presentation. I think the next slide is just asking for questions. All right, thank you everyone. Um, so we have a few questions. And just a, a quick reminder on that last slide. So our next webinar is September 14th, and that's SDOT talking about restoring transportation. We're considering some other sessions. Um, so to stay posted, you can go to our events calendar on the Seattle Office of Emergency Management site. So I'm going to go through a few of these questions. The first one I see, I'm going to try to kind of take and then I'll throw it out to the group if there's any other um, thoughts on it. So the question was, if the cell phone towers are down and alert Seattle isn't working, how will we be told to boil water or get other alerts from the city? Um, so just a, a couple things here. Um, yes, it's possible that that phone towers are down, like structurally damaged. I think more likely what we see and from what we've seen in other places um, is that the system is overwhelmed and it's overwhelmed because everyone's trying to call and text and do everything at the same time. Um, so one way around that and one thing we would likely use are wireless emergency alerts. So, so those alerts that automatically come to your phone like Amber Alerts. Um, so the way that system works and we in Seattle can issue those ourselves. Um, and the way that system works is it's, it's not using the same systems as data and voice calls. So it's not impacted by congestion of the normal cellular system. And we would likely use that because if we had to, to kind of tell people to take a life safety action like boil water and we had to tell the whole city, WIA would allow us to just ping all cell phones regardless of whether people were subscribed. Um, outside of that, I mean, the thing we're always recommending is to have, you know, traditional radios like AM, FM radios. Um, we're going to be pushing things out to media and it's you know very likely that some radio stations will still be up and pushing information out that way. Um, social media, so there could be cellular connection problems, but people may be able to access Wi-Fi and share information that way. Um, so it's really have access to all of these things. I think with the things like WIA and the phone, it's at least have a way to have some backup power to charge your device, even if it's just an extra battery pack, something like that, so you can keep your um, device charged. And then the, the last thing I would mention is um, emergency communication hubs. So if you've been on any of these other webinars, we've talked about hubs quite a bit. So there's about 130 hub locations throughout the city. You can find that information on our website and past resource sheets, um, and, and we can provide that in the follow-up email. Um, but a lot of hub locations have amateur radio volunteers that work at those hub sites. We work closely with the auxiliary Seattle Auxiliary Communication Services, which works under OEM and provides amateur radio support. So we do foresee, you know, when all else fails and all things are down, that amateur radio is one way for us to push information out to community locations, potentially those hub locations, so, so knowing where those are. So it's really a matter of having access to and knowing about all of these different things. Um, it, it's very unlikely that everything everywhere will not be working after an event. So the more redundancy you can have, the better. I don't know if anyone else has anything to add, Chad, Brittany. 
Matt, I think you nailed it. Um, you know, we always talk about our uh, outreach during emergencies and incidents. Uh, each of our channels, whether it's Alert Seattle or even all the way down to, you know, crews that are on the ground knocking on doors or leaving door hangers, they're all pieces of the puzzle. So uh, the more aware people can make themselves of the, the channels that you talked about and, and get access to it, whether it's a weather radio for some, you know, hazards, a regular radio, signing up for Alert Seattle, understanding that we have the wireless emergency alerts that's a little bit different, uh, connecting with neighbors, making sure you have an out of area contact that you can, you know, for us, you know, we've got um, my wife's uncle who lives in Jacksonville, Florida. We all call that person to get information about how everybody else in the area would be doing. And they also probably have access to national media that might be covering some of the things that are happening too. So that that's two way as well. So um, I just wanted to reinforce what Matt said and just to, to really try and put as many of those communication puzzle pieces together as you possibly can. Uh, and that that's how we'd be able to get to you. But it is unlikely that all of those, especially the ones that Matt and I both just mentioned are all gonna go down at the same time. So we'll be able to get, get the information to you. All right, and just real quick, um, uh, another one just came up that's kind of related, so I'll, I'll just address that quick. Do you have ways to prioritize communication on cell phones when there is congestion, like you mentioned in the Squally? So there are some ways that we can do that on the government end. Um, so one of them is called GETS, and I'm not going to be able to uh, think of government emergency telecommunication systems, I want to say. So a lot of us who are responders in some way have, have a card that we carry around with us, and it, and it has a way to access priority service. So there are some things like that for especially people responding, um, both the actual phones we have and the network they're on, and then the GET system, which allows us kind of this channel to get priority service. So that, that does exist. Um, all right, so now I'm going to go back to others. So this one would be an SPU question. When you repair pipes in the ground after a water main break, are you putting in more resilient pipes? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, we've got a lot of information on our seismic program. I think that's in the, the uh, resource seat, but the answer is definitely yes. So, you know, we've got um, repairs that have to be made uh, because pipes age out or they just break. Uh, and so when we go in there, where we feel we can get the most bang for our buck and in installing seismic resistant pipe, um, we're doing that. There's some areas that, you know, aren't as subject based on our modeling to, um, you know, ground displacement and things like that, where it doesn't make sense to spend kind of that, that pot of funds that we have to put seismic resistant uh, pipe in there, but there are other places where it absolutely does. So we've got a seismic program at SPU, a seismic program manager that based on the modeling, when something is up for replacement or it breaks, it's definitely being considered. Thanks, Chad. And, and this one might be for, I don't know, all of you. Um, I, I think Michelle spoke to this somewhat. Um, but it's just kind of a general question. It seems like the big one might destroy one or more dams. So Michelle and or Chad, I don't know if you want to speak anymore just to the vulnerability of dams and, and work we do around that. Yeah, so I, I think Chad, I didn't actually have a slide about this, but Chad talked about it a little bit more, like what are the likely faults that we're worried about in the Seattle area? And so I can tell you that for our larger dam systems, um, typic, back in the day when they were siting dams, we typically picked locations that you can put the dam on foundational bedrock. <laughs> So they inherently are a little bit more resilient to these types of activities. And I can say we probably the ones that we would be the most concerned about, the ones actually closest to town, um, the, the larger dams, we, we don't see the fault activity in those areas, but we do run all of those scenarios. And then when we do um, our periodic deep studies on, on the dams uh, that we have to for federal uh, reasons, um, regulations and things that we study all of those scenarios, but really the most risks that we see are closer here to Seattle um, based on the actual locations of our other systems. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. You know, I'd add that even in the event of um, 
a really significant quake. Um, while we planned in our emergency action plans for the 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 dam basically <laughs> essentially disappearing or you know failing in an incredibly improbable amount of time. Um, that's not how things usually happen with dams as well. Um, so really, public safety like uh, Michelle and Brittany and I all mentioned is is at the top of the list. So we plan to be able to move people and and things out of the way of those failing dam spurts. And then at the same time, these emergency action plans are are they're pretty thick. So they have a lot of different studies and details in there about potential failure modes and things like that. And there's a lot of response in there for us to actually be able to save the dam. So you know even if we activate um, you know emergency notifications or even work with local emergency management to evacuate and things like that, um, it's it's very likely that um, in a dam failure that you know we're going to be working on it for a while and, and attempting to save this dam with all the resources that you know we can with uh, local state federal uh, responses much like they did in the the Oroville situation down in California so um, while we really prepare for for dams and like especially when one does fail it's, it's really um, a huge impact for a community uh, you know it's something that we look at dams you know, in and of themselves are, are fairly resilient because of the way that they're they're constructed. Um, but we still do have to plan for that really unlikely scenario that this, this dam does fail very quickly. So um, that's why we do have such tight and regulated and, and, and coordinated responses to these things. Um, like for us in those, those dams that are close to to Seattle. They're actually out in King County. We work very closely with the King County Office of Emergency Management. And just like we have notification systems here in Seattle, uh, you know, we've shared our information with those folks out there uh, so that they can respond, um, you know, in just as robust a way that we would for our own customers here. Thanks, Chad. And then two more questions, which I'm going to group together as uh, part one and two. These are the good water quality questions I was waiting to give Chad on like I dare you to drink this or drink that. Um, so the first one is Lake Union. Is there a way to make Lake Union water drinkable? Can communities invest in equipment that would filter out hazardous materials? And then the second one is about a hot tub. Could you drink the water out of your hot tub? These are always great questions. And so there is incredibly advanced filtration equipment and treatment equipment and chemicals uh, available to, you know, even anybody that wants to go out there and kind of order stuff. And there's, a, there's a lot of great stuff on the internet. Um, what I wanna say first and foremost, when people ask these questions is to make sure that uh, we understand that storing safe emergency drinking water is the answer to all of this. And at the same time as I say that, I know that um, storing emergency drinking water takes up a lot of space and this stuff is super heavy, right? So, you know, if you live in um, a house with a garage or you've got a shed, you can kind of stack this stuff up. But we've got a lot of people that live in multifamily housing uh, in Seattle where, you know, if you've got a family of three or even a family of, of five plus a dog like, like I have, and you start talking about a gallon per person per day for two weeks. Uh, one time I actually went through, um, I think it was with a, a hub captain or something, one of the emergency communication hub captains. And we calculated how much this would actually weigh and it was like 760 pounds of water for two weeks at 8.6 pounds per gallon. So it, it is a lot. So uh, really first and foremost, store as much drinking water as you possibly can. And then I would say that I would definitely be looking for one of the Red Cross emergency response vehicles or trying to get myself to one of the hardened hydrants with an SPU manifold on it before I try to drink anything out of Lake Union. And that's not even thinking about what's in Lake Union right now. If you think back to the drainage and wastewater impacts portion of the presentation that I just gave, there's gonna be an incredibly huge amount of sewage flowing into our waterways when the drainage and wastewater system is impacted by a Seattle fault or significant, you know, magnitude seven or eight event like that. So even depending on whether you can filter this stuff, even getting some of this water that's near the shoreline on your hands, right, and doing this kind of stuff is not something that you want to be messing around with. That being said, looking at your hot tub, right, you know, depending on what you got in there with you on, right, like then uh, on, on your body, who knows what you're able to do to drink out of it. If you've got treatment and stuff, you know, a little bit of bleach and we've got the, the dosage and the, and the resources goes a really long way on some of these things. So 
Uh, best case scenario is you've done some really important work and stored as much drinking water as you possibly can, and you don't ever have to think about drinking out of your hot tub or like union. The worst case scenario is you really need that water, right? And if you don't drink it, you're going to be in really bad shape or even die. I don't think we'll have to get there with some of the preparedness and things we've done here in the city of Seattle and federal resources coming in. But I would never tell somebody to say, you know, go ahead and die of thirst instead of trying to take a sip out of your hot tub if you tried to, to go ahead and, and put some bleach in there or, or treat it through one of the filters there. Um, the other thing that I can say is that if you've got really specific questions on, you know, hey, I've got this filter and it says it does this, right? And I'm thinking about putting this water into it and taking a sip out of it in an emergency. Um, what Matt and Tay have done with me is we put that water quality hotline in the resource feed. Um, you know, they're not robots down there. I've got uh, really good friends that work in the SPU Water Quality Lab. These are great scientists that care deeply about the about water quality, and they like talking to people about it. So if you've got questions about, you know, if I put this through this type of filter and you can read the back of it to them or give them the model and they can look it up, they'd be happy to respond to you as well. Thanks, Chad. That was very helpful. You know, I would just reiterate what Chad said. I mean, store water, store water, store water. So that's that's going to be your best bet. We did a um, podcast with KUOW a couple years ago where I, I toured the producer's house and, and drank her five year old bottled water that was in her um, garage. And, and, and I'm alive. So even if you store water and you didn't, you know, swap it out as often as you wanted, um, that's really going to be your best option. Um, so with that, that that was all the questions. I am going to add one thing in the announcements quick. So we did have a question about could we have a session um, separate on hubs, which that has come up before. So I, I am going to schedule something specific to hubs, um, but there's actually an event um, tomorrow that HSD and our Aging and Disability Services hosting a Facebook event that is all about emergency hubs. So I just put the link to that. So if you are available to attend that, um, you can do that, but we'll also have a separate session. Um, so with that, as I mentioned, we will follow up early next week. If you registered with an email or signed into Teams with an email, we'll send out a copy of these slides a link to the recording, send that resource sheet again. So thank you everyone for joining and uh, look for that email. And hopefully you can also join us on September 14th for our Restoring Transportation webinar. Thank you.